Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 26th Annual Williston Basin Petroleum Conference. We are excited to welcome you all to the city of Bismarck, North Dakota for what's going to be a great week. My name is Bruce Hicks. I'm the Assistant Director of the Oil and Gas Division with the North Dakota Industrial Commission. And I'm a registered professional engineer and have been with the commission for 40 years. There's been a lot of changes in the last four decades for the oil and gas industry in North Dakota. And the past year has been one for the, for the history books. COVID-19 actually uh, shut down this conference twice and put it off for about a year. And we are grateful today for being able to meet in person and share valuable information of our presenters for the next three days. So let's get started. Our first session is Surface Well Site Solutions with session chair uh, Darren Schmidt. Darren Schmidt is an assistant director for the subsurface R&D at the Energy and Environmental Research Center. He leads a team focused on research, development, and commercialization related to the efficient and clean fossil fuel production, utilization, carbon management, and renewable energy. Darren holds a BS degree in mechanical engineering and is a registered professional engineer in mechanical and petroleum disciplines. Prior to his position at ERC, he worked for Equinor in operations and research. Please help me welcome Darren Schmidt. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we have a fantastic session for you today. Um, I do want to start with a, a, a quick safety message, and, and that is um, everybody's driving to and from here. It's the riskiest thing we do in the oil business. Um, remember to uh, talk with your loved ones about getting right. So we, anytime there's a, a potential for a head-on collision, you want to be sure that you avoid a head-on collision at all costs and get right. If you have a, a, a if you're on a four-lane highway and you have a car that's on the right side of you, it's safer to get right and take that car with you in the ditch versus um, hitting something head on. So if you don't remember anything today, remember get right, okay? So um, I have just a quick uh, thing to share with you today and then we'll get on with our speakers. Um, we, we run a program called Bauckham Optimization Program at EERC. It's a, a group of a number of operators. And the challenge that we have in front of us uh, today in the Bakken as we move through, uh, you know, going after our core acreage where the economics are really good, um, we, we now, you know, look to that other acreage that's high break even. And so I just want to mention a little bit about that. Um, this is just to show, uh, don't, don't take the numbers uh, to the books. This is just meant to show relative uh, cases. But, you know, what, on, a, on a cumulative production basis, what is a, a high break even well? What is a low break even well? Um, we, we would love it if all our wells perform on the blue curve. You know, but we're running out of those. So, wh what do we, you know, what do we need to do next? And and we need to work on the, the yellow curve and the orange curve. The dotted lines are suggesting where we can get to, and how we can affect that break-even cost. And and that work is going to, you know, focus on how how we tailor to that acreage. So, what do we need to do on the completion? What do we need to do on the stimulation to bring down that development cost, and then where do we go with optimizing production? Um, there's a number of things we can do in that space, and then what do we do on our costs? And uh, with with salt water disposal being one of those highest costs. So, just a bit of a teaser. This is uh, things to come in our in our program. If you're interested in that program, please um, get in touch with me. So, um, the lineup today is uh, Brad Gushlak. Um He's going to talk about spill prevention from Aventive. Um And then we, we have a talk uh, from KLJ on engineered well pads and environmental remediation. 
Uh, Luke Lee is going to talk to us about some bioremediation technology that's pretty exciting. And uh, then we're going to finish up with an overview of the statewide P&A program. So that's our preview for today. Um, we're going to start a video with uh, Brad's presentation from Oventive. So if we can cue that up and, and uh, let's get that rolling. My name is Brad Duslack, and uh, due to travel restrictions, I'll be presenting virtually to you folks today. I appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to Oventive's process safety story and how our journey has helped us reduce unintended and unplanned loss of primary containment, or I'll refer to today as uh, LOPC for short. So I just want to open today by providing an overview of the evolution of process safety at Oventive and how our executives supported its implementation. As per the diagram on the left, uh, looking from a high level, the development process kind of went as such. Um, as noted, it was our CEO's executive sponsorship that, that aided in the creation of the Process Safety Committee, which is made up of technical experts from different disciplines across the company. From there, there a team was created that took direction from the steering committee and started working on what process safety looked like at Ovinto. Through the team's efforts in alignment with OSHA regulations, API 754 and IOGP 456, we created process safety systems that we could integrate and implement. So the team that got created, uh, their mandate basically was to help drive processes that keep flammable and hazardous substance in its primary containment, which, which really works in concert with reducing spills. It was also to focus on company-wide implementation of those process safety related processes. So as you know, uh, when the stakeholders are in included uh, in the building of the system, it, it has a much greater uptake. Uh, we also wanted to increase process safety intelligence and the process safety metric ev evolution. So kind of back to the philosophy of what gets measured gets done. And lastly, be visible and collaborative in supporting the business areas, which for us meant getting out to the field and aiding in the integration. Um, all this um, had a key desired outcome in mind of keeping flammable and hazardous substances in its primary containment. So to start with, we had to understand what PSM model fit our business and how best we could integrate it into our current safety management system. Since at the time we had already had some OSHA PSM regulated facilities, we decided to continue down the path of integrating the 14 elements um, into the rest of our facilities, which were non-regulated. As mentioned, we decided to align with the API 754 and IOGP 456 documents. So using these resources, we did a gap assessment to our uh, existing safety uh, management system, which was Ethos, to understand what elements we needed to develop. When looking at how to align and integrate process safety into our existing system, we decided to create a standalone process safety standard, which could become one of the 12 standards that make up our management system. These standards are basically the building blocks of ethos. This is the way we were able to align and integrate uh, process safety into our management system. The result, um, we revamped ethos and evolved our safety management system into what we call an operational safety management system, which really means uh, we introduced process safety and which it created uh, more of a technical and operational component to the management system. From there, um, the previously mentioned gap assessment, we, we created practices to address those 14 elements that were not covered in ethos. So we launched those practices back in June of uh, 2016 and put performance measures in place on our corporate scorecard. The creation of the nine practices drove processes that were linked to the loss, the, to reducing loss of primary containment. We actually did many of the concepts that uh, were within the practices we created, but this really helped solidify the system and gave us some written repeatable guidance. <clears throat> Probably the most notable practice um, that linked to spill reduction was the in, uh, integrity management practice. So as you can see on the slide, um, the list of practices that supported our process safety standard, um, one of them was MOC, uh, which we had, but we revamped and 
really helped to identify and manage risk around changes that were not in kind. Uh, PHA, process hazard assessments, um, basically written guidance of a risk management tool to systematically evaluate our facilities. Um, PSI, process safety information. So really the information and knowledge that we needed to safely operate our facilities and pre-startup safety review. Um, this included the minimum requirements to start in our facilities. Uh, SOPs, um, as most companies have, help us manage risk and uh, deficiencies through administrative controls. And then another one we added was CIMOPS, which really has been a, become an important uh, efficiency within our business and deals with communication, uh, documentation, and planning when two disciplines interface on a site. Mechanical integrity, like I mentioned, really the operating and maintenance of equipment, right from design to preventative maintenance to decommissioning. Um, also well barrier control, so making sure we had the right equipment in site, uh, the right pressures, we had ERPs in place, <clears throat> the right um, barriers down hole. And then lastly, uh, was well designed. So really understanding that we had uh, the correct, well safe operating parameters in place, um, that a well program was made, um, which we call a basis of design for things like the, the casing, cementing and tubing. So basically each of these having guidance that would uh, drive a reduction in, uh, in LOPCs. A notable decision we made in regard to process safety integration was that uh, regulations call out uh, specific facilities that process uh, safety elements apply to. So after some divestitures, Ovintiv actually didn't have any more facilities that qualified as uh, PSM regulated facilities. But understanding the benefit um, of having these process safety management um, processes in place, we decided to apply them not only to the regulated facilities, but to all our facilities. So basically, we took the program uh, right from our wellhead to, to our pipelines. And like many initiatives to, to ensure effectiveness and have a repeatable and integrated system, measurement is key. Uh, the reporting criteria we developed, like I said, was based on the API and IOGP standards. Um, although we maintain the ability to, to pull the data in alignment with those documents, we also tweak the measurement criteria to fit our business. And I'll talk a bit more to this on, on the next slide. From there, we incorporated a process safety event um, metric into our corporate scorecard and set a target based on previous performance and continual improvement. So with the new uh, reporting metric in place, we also had to align our investigation protocols and reporting uh, to support this new process. Our objective in reporting on the corporate scorecard was to focus basically on what matters most, especially with optimizing uh, resources um, as we do in, in today's business to be the most efficient and effective as possible. We found through analysis that it was advantageous to add a filter to the API tier one and tier two events, um, more specifically on fires and explosions, gas releases and spills. This really ensured that we wouldn't be diluting our efforts and, and, and missing the key issues. So just to run you through uh, a quick example, say we had an unplanned, uncontrolled spill uh, with a harmful substance and um, the volume was over the threshold volume for a tier one or tier two event, which is where we made the cutoff <clears throat> for what would go on our corporate scorecard. Uh, we would then apply a severity filter that considered um, the product spill, uh, the receiving environment, uh, environmental impact, regulatory impact, and reputational impact. Then through analysis, we made a severity threshold of 0 0.35 to get on our scorecard. So this criteria would drive the event to have a more rigorous investigation and accountability um, around that process. So this is what the results look like since 2016 for the unplanned, uncontrolled uh, releases that matter most to Ovento. Uh, since the in inception of the process safety metric, we've uh, seen a continual improvement year after year in the reduction of the overall severity of our process safety scorecard events. Also, the number of overall events continues to be on the right track as well. So diving into some specifics that, that got us uh, there are as follows. 
One of the first areas we focused on uh, to help uh, drive the reduction of LOPCs was to put an emphasis on mechanical integrity. We found our systems and processes in place to support human factors were strong. So for the most part, we made mechanical integrity of our equipment the initial priority. To address the equipment, we broke out the major components into seven categories and analyzed them from an operational standpoint as per our integrity management plans and our process safety practices. So those uh, seven components included uh, the vessels and tanks, um, the relief devices, pipelines, uh, instrument and electrical safety devices, rotating equipment, safety critical equipment, and service provider expectations. So through area reviews, uh, we were able to evaluate the current state of the processes and overall knowledge of the mechanical integrity factors. In conjunction with those areas, area reviews, we also sent, us, sent out a survey to our production operations staff. The plan here was to get insight into mechanical integrity, um, the, basically the knowledge of our team. The survey itself was done through SurveyMonkey and pulled the operation staff to basically self-disclose on the perceived knowledge of mechanical integrity, covering the seven components that we saw on the previous slide. From the results, we were able to see areas that presented an opportunity for improvement. So through the survey, we were able to target the areas that required education. This table represents at a company level, um, but each operating area had their different variances. Overall, the top two categories for training at a company level were, were around tanks, so which included the aspects like um, uh, coatings required on tanks, cathodic and pr protection, uh, inspection criteria and re re relief device inspection. And then secondly, we're around uh, car seals, which uh, help ensure valves are in the correct position, valving matches, site P and IDs, and helps ensure block valves under relief valves are always open. So some specific examples of follow-up that helped align our staff actions with our practices and integrated them into their work processes where we added tank inspections to operator rounds to proactively look for leaks. Back to the car seals, we developed and integrated a car seal SOP. Also, we identified safety critical equipment and ensuring that equipment, uh, that equipment, um, because it is so important, had a, a robust maintenance plan in place. And just an overall general education for our operation staff on integrity management um, basically of our, of our pipelines and vessels as well. So, and these all aspects all lend themselves to uh, proactively preventing loss of primary containment. Also to help sustain the knowledge, uh, educate and identify gaps, we started doing an assessment um, internally that we called a PSSA and it's a process safety self-assessment and, and we did this on our larger facilities. This is where we would pick a team of multidisciplinary, um, multidisciplined operation staff from the facility, uh, go through and answer a list of questions that validate key requirements in our process safety practices. The goal here was basically twofold, to educate our uh, Oventive operations and validate the implementation of the practices. Uh, the process for the PSSA is the process safety team reviews the question with the team that operates the facilities and, and pick to do the assessment, uh, assigns the questions uh, to the appropriate discipline and supports the completion of the assessment. So the operators and maintenance staff actually fill it out themselves. A final review is typically held with everyone uh, involved and both positive observations and opportunities for improvement are identified. And, and the tie back to reduction in LOPCs comes back to aspects like, um, are the correct SOPs developed and being followed? Um, are inspections being completed? And are the appropriate maintenance plans in place? Um, really looking at safety through more of a technical lens. And uh, we found this arms our people with a better understanding of how to most effectively operate our sites. Understanding, I guess, aspects like um, the types of controls used uh, for credits uh, from a PHA in a design facility really gives an, an operator um, a higher level of operations understanding. 
Also understanding that service providers can uh, pose a risk of creating a spill or LOPC, we decided to work with our key service providers on discussing our process safety expectations and process safety best practices. So we have a focused assessment, um, or we mainly focused our assessments on fracking companies and flowback companies, uh, obviously the volume of fluid there and the risk of spills. Uh, this process, much like our internal PSSA process, reviews the service providers programs for alignment with our process safety practices and guidelines that help us prevent unplanned and controlled releases. All the categories lend themselves to preventing spills and reducing spill consequences, but a few specifically we find um, especially aligned well with spill prevention. Also very interesting, um, without going into great detail, we find that we discover opportunities when applying engineering and design reviews like we do to our operating facilities, um, things like HAZOPS uh, to kind of our standard designs, we're applying them to flowback and frack setups. Um, typically, you know, those service providers will look at um, each component tip, um, individually and it's got an engineered sign off. But like a facility, um, is the whole thing looked at from an engineering standpoint as, as an entire package? So that was kind of a, a key finding that, we're, that we've been running into. And a few other areas that we find um, just around the, validating the use of the PSSR, the process safety uh, startup review. Um, basically proactively and mitigating leaks before we start up. Mechanical integrity, um, we, we really kind of lent that self to iron management and washouts. So things like the, does the integrity, uh, integrity plan account for erosional velocities, uh, sand concentration and operating conditions. You know, many companies now are starting to track mileage on piping and just ensuring that those, um, you know, putting UT, based on data and trends and, and just really focusing on, on iron management. And frack fire mitigation guideline um, is another one that we added. And really we were looking around, a good part of that was maintenance on uh, things like hydraulic systems. And you know we found a big opportunity there from past in, in incidents on our sites. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the process is not punitive, but rather a collaborative system uh, to look at, uh, look for opportunities um, with our, our service providers. Another tool worth mentioning that our process safety team started utilizing was a bow tie analysis. And, you know, initially we started using it as a communication tool uh, to display incident reviews and show the improvements that we made to the systems. Um, when we had process safety incidents, we'd line up the barriers and it gives a better understanding of which barriers actually failed and which new barriers need, needed reinforcement or, or new barriers that actually would, would need placement. So, you know, for example, some common uh, proactive barriers on, on the left side of the bow tie um, uh, around um, corrosion was, you know, we saw building to the right codes and standards you know, with things like pigging, the chemical injection, um, our AUT inspection programs, uh, velocity calculations, understanding that for erosion, uh, pigging and SOPs, and um, and in some cases some enhanced chemical treatment. And then on the right hand side, more the proactive or um, or reactive uh, barriers for corrosion um, helped us kind of align what we needed to do for operator checks, the alarms we needed in place, um, operators' response to those alarms, uh, spill response, and ERP. So. And we did also expand the bow tie uh, analysis to, to help us identify what barriers are actually safety critical. As, as you line them up, it really gives you a good perspective on that. So, so uh, kind of a key tool that our process safety team utilizes. So back to a few statistics, I guess for those familiar with the API um, classification at a company level, uh, we've seen continual reduction of our tier one and OVV scorecard incidents. Um, the program integration plan by these measures, you know, has been successful. And I believe it is good evidence to help define the level of implementation. The evolution definitely is not uh, overnight and is progressive, but uh, not like any unsuccessful program or successful system, loss of primary, uh, uh, loss of primary containment prevention requires processes that are repeatable 
integratable, systematic, and continually improving. So then lastly, and just a little closer to home, you know, as we integrate new assets into the OVV portfolio, looking at the operating area that includes the Wilson Basin, um, which has been exposed to the Ovento Process Safety Program for about the last two years now, we've also seen an initial reduction in volume and number of spills over 2019 and 2020. So, you know, an interesting point that we found is when we go through mergers and acquisitions is that we always have much to learn from the new assets as well. Uh, utilizing different points of view and operating styles has brought a greater depth to our program for sure. So with that, I just want to thank everyone for their time today. And hopefully this gives you some insight and maybe sparks uh, some ideas for your own company's programs. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to contact me directly. Thank you. Okay, just like to point out that um, our speakers' bios are in the program, so highly encourage you to, to look up the speaker's bio in there, see what they've had to say about themselves, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, our next two speakers are Daphne Sen and Corey Arith with KLJ. Um, Daphne is a project manager with a civil engineering degree, and uh, Corey is an environmental scientist and uh, has an MS degree in range science. Um, both Daphne and Corey are products of North Dakota State University, so very happy to have them here. Um, uh, come on up and, and get started and look forward to your talk. Thank you, Darren. I'm Corey, and today I am going to talk to you about, maybe, I'm going to talk to you about our topics of our discussion. Daphne here is going to start off introducing us to what an engineered well pad is. Then we are gonna talk about integrating environmental conditions into our location feasibility and site selection process. Daphne is gonna talk about pad, access road, and erosion and sediment control measures, the design portion of that. I'm gonna talk about the importance of reclamation and as-built data, and then we are going to finish off with some pros and cons of engineered well pads. Spoiler alert, there are more pros than cons. I'm also going to tell you right off the bat what our take-home message is. Upfront, thoughtful planning equals minimizing and mitigating your risk. So please keep that in mind as we go through our presentation. And if you go home with that today, we did our job. So with that, Daphne, could you please let us know what an engineered well pad is? Thank you, Corey. And good afternoon, everyone. So the easiest way to explain to you what an engineered well pad is, is by showing you ex of examples of pads that were not engineered. So on the screen here, you'll see several photos of issues that you've probably likely experienced in the field or dealt with on your own sites. Um, the first photo here on the left is uh, some stormwater ponding around a tank battery on an existing pad and erosion starting around that tank battery. The next photo is of some severe ponding on uh, the surface of a well pad. Um, it, this probably looks like a photo of a lake, but I assure you this is actually mm -hmm. a photo of a well pad surface, and you can see the berm, perimeter berm on the pad in the background, and then actually there is a lake in the back, further in the background, um, but uh, you know that berm is to keep any contaminants on the pad, but it's also keeping the stormwater on the pad, which obviously we don't want super saturating the surface of that pad. The next photo is of a large gully um, that is causing erosion off of a pad and leading sediment into the adjacent roadside ditch that you can see in the background of this photo. And then finally, this is a pad surface that's severely rutted, um, likely due to some stormwater ponding, as we discussed on the previous photos. Um, and it could also be a result of maybe inadequate compaction during construction or possibly um, the wrong kind of surfacing or maybe not enough surfacing placed on the pad surface. 
So um, we can't just show pads that were not engineered, so we'll go ahead and show you some photos that we took with our drone of some pads that we actually did a civil engineer design for. Um, so in this case, uh, the operator uh, needed to place these pads in area of very rough terrain. So they came to us and they, wanted, they thought it would be worthwhile to spend a little more time up front with some design and planning so that they could identify any issues that they're going to have in the long run. So you'll notice thoughtful placement of BMPs, um, such as silt fence, um, uh, stormwater outlets, uh, riprap uh, channels. Uh, we, it's kind of hard to tell in here, but we placed the topsoil pile at the top of the cut slope to kind of divert that stormwater around the site. Um, we paid close attention to uh, approach location and dealt with the county on that. And then we also work with the facilities and drilling teams with the operators so that we can optimal or provide an optimal pad layout so we don't have any wasted space. So, Corey, where do we start? The best place to start is at the beginning. So, our client would like an L, a well pad and access road to go somewhere in that general area, so that red polygon. We'll call it our study area. And now the client could have just decided they know exactly where they want the pad, right? There is that always that perfect location. And so then they would send out survey to acquire topo, and then they would build the design. And so they would then send environmental and cultural out to essentially clear the area. But what happens if there was Dakota Skipper habitat that was directly impacted by that well pad? More money would need to be spent to send out survey, environmental, and cultural back to the field to collect more data. And then the design team essentially would have to start back from the beginning. So in this situation, how about we send environmental and cultural out first? They can include any protocols that any federal agencies might need. They can collect the data, see what you're dealing with, and then we will take that data, give it to the design team, and they can design around those environmental constraints. Essentially, when you look at this, right, there's a lot of unknowns until you get boots on the ground. All that we're doing is mitigating that up front. Let's see what the environmental and cultural teams found. So you can see there's a wetland in the bottom of the drainage. They delineated some Dakota skipper habitat, and the archaeologists found some cultural sites. Now, all of this data is ready to be packaged and given to the design team so that they can incorporate that into their location feasibility and site selection protocol. Location feasibility and site selection, also known as the scoping phase. Um, this is where the design team does a desktop analysis and a field review of the potential well site. So during the desktop analysis, we look at the watershed for that area um, via topographic maps. We also look at historical aerial imagery for the area so that we can look for evidence of maybe some scars that would lead us to believe that there's existing utilities or other infrastructure in the area. Um, in areas where there's really rough terrain, sometimes we will utilize publicly available LIDAR data, and we'll bring that into a CAD drawing and we'll do a rough grading of the area so that we can identify any potential issues up front. Um, we also look to see what county or township or state agencies that we will have to be dealing with and what standards we'll have to follow in order to um, design any roadways or approaches so that we can make sure that we're gonna be able to meet their needs. And then finally, we take the environmental uh, report that Corey's team gives to us with all those constraints so that we can consider those whenever we're doing our design. Um, so then we do the field review. We send out a designer to take a look at the actual site in person so that we can identify anything that maybe wasn't noticeable in our desktop analysis. So some of the things that we look for in the field review include site distance. So like I said before, we want to make sure that we're meeting those minimum um, standards that are set forth by the local township or county for our approach that we are proposing to access our site. Uh, with that, we also want to look at the spacing of any of the existing approaches, especially if we're planning to place a new approach so that we don't have any issues there. Uh, we also look at any nearby new infrastructure that maybe wasn't noticeable in the historical imagery. Um, and that can also be identified by utility markers that we didn't notice in that imagery as well, or above ground utilities that wasn't noticeable. And then finally, we just take a look at the terrain. Um, sometimes things jump out at you when you're actually there in person that maybe you didn't notice in the desktop analysis. So then, once we narrow down the area, which is clear of all the constraints, 
and the issues that we discovered during the scoping phase, we move on to our design phase. So when we do pad and road design, the major thing that we focus on is our stormwater analysis. We take a look at that watershed that's coming onto that project area, and ideally, we want to place our well pad at the top of the watershed. Um, if we have it at the top of the watershed, then the only water that you have to deal with coming onto the pad is the water that's falling out of the sky. However, situations are not always ideal, especially in the oil field. So oftentimes we are having other water coming onto the pad and we can't place it at the top of the watershed. So in those situations, we take that stormwater data and we analyze it and we design a combination of stormwater ditches and diversion berms to mitigate that stormwater that's trying to come onto the pad and get it ideally to go flow around the pad or if it does have to come on the pad, we make sure we handle it appropriately. Um, next, we work with the facility and drilling teams with the operator um, so that we can provide an optimal pad layout for their activities and equipment that has no wasted space. Um, and like I mentioned before, for the access design, we work with the local county and township, sometimes the NDDOT, to um, make sure that we are meeting their standards that they have set forth and um, making sure that that approval process happens seamlessly and smoothly. Um, and then we also use their standards to uh, do improvements to existing roadways that might need to be utilized as part of the project. And then finally, we can work as a liaison with a geotechnical firm to coordinate a geotechnical analysis for the site because we want to look at those important factors such as your specific fill factor, uh, your topsoil depth, and your surfacing alternatives. Um, so let's apply this back to the example that Corey brought up. Um, on the screen there, I know it's really hard to see, uh, blue represents the fill area on the pad. So on the bottom right is that a big fill slope um, on the pad, and then the top or the left side is a um, topsoil or topsoil pile. So um, here we were able to work with the geotech report. They gave us the depth of that topsoil so that we could accurately depict the size of that topsoil pile on that plan. That helped us out in this situation because this particular pad was constrained on all four sides. Um, we had a county road on one side, and then the other three sides we had the um, environmental constraints that Corey's team found. So we didn't have a whole lot of space to put a topsoil pile, but we were able to de determine in our design phase that the amount of topsoil on site, we could likely squeeze it in there like we did. Uh, secondly, we were able to use that topsoil to place it uh, left on the screen view that you see is north, which is where that watershed's coming onto the pad. We were able to place that topsoil pad on the top of that cut slope um, and then divert the stormwater around the pad so that you have less stormwater that you have to handle when it, when it comes on down around the pad. So let's see how the design team did with uh, their pad design and how that comes into play with uh, the environmental constraints that we had given to them. It's always a good practice, right, for us to look at the preliminary design, environmental. So this way we can make sure that nothing was missed, we can ensure that all applicable buffers are being met, and if there are any concerns, these things can be brought up right up front. Here is Daphne's design. So for the most part, they did a great job, right? They avoided all of the shapefiles that we had submitted to them. However, I would go back to Daphne and her team and express some concern with that southwest fill slope and its proximity to the wetland. Again, that appears to be a very steep grade, and I would just want to ensure them to ensure that the erosion and sediment control devices that they design adequately prevent any soil from leaving that site and entering into that wetland. Yep, so in regards to what Corey just said, as part of the design process, it's good practice to always include an erosion and sediment control or reclamation plan as part of the design package. Uh, basically, the plan just shows thoughtful placement of your BMP, such as your straw waddles, um, your fiber rolls, your erosion control blanket, riprap channels and uh, plunge pools, um, stormwater outlets, silt vents, etc. Um, this does three things. So first of all, it provides a guide for your contractors so that they can provide a precise bid for their stormwater um, things that they're going to lay out on the site. And there's no question about whether they put the things that you had planned for. Secondly, it provides a guide for your owner or a plan for your owner so that they know that they're getting what they expect. And then thirdly, it provides a guide for your SWIP inspectors 
so that when they are providing feedback to the contractor or owner so that when they have to do some fixes on the sediment controls, everybody's on the same page. So let's apply this back to the example. This is the same pad that we've been talking about. That fill slope is in the southwest corner. North is up on this view. Um, so we took into what Corey said, we took that into consideration and we placed um, erosion control blanket all on that entire fill slope. Um, lots of straw wattles, as you can see. Um, fiber rolls down both sides of the fill slope where the fill slope meets the existing ground so that we can capture that um, concentrated flow and slow it down. Uh, we have our stormwater outlet at the top of the pad that's letting the water from the ditches around the pad out. Uh, ideally, we would not allow that water to flow down to a big drainage or a wetland. Um, however, water flows downhill, and in this particular instance, that was the only way that we could get it out of the pad. So we just implemented extra precautions, such as we have a riprap um, plunge pool at the top where the outlet's at, and then we have a riprap channel all the way down the slope to another riprap plunge pool at the bottom to just really slow that water down and allow it to sheet flow out of that plunge pool. And then finally, we did two layers of silt fence at the bottom uh, at the end of the fill, or the, uh, fill slope so that we have that extra prote protection and hopefully we will not have any sediment leaving site towards the wetland. As far as reclamation goes, we have one ultimate goal, right? To establish grass. To take it a step further, we would like that grass to establish quickly to reduce any surface erosion. And we would like deep fibrous roots to hold that soil in place, especially on those steep slopes. To achieve this, we need to have a site-specific seed mixture that was des designed with accounting for your location, your soil texture, your percent grade, and any other special conditions such as salinity. Look, you can't just throw any seed on anywhere and expect it to grow, right? Certain plants love certain soils, so let's match them up and ensure that what you plant actually establishes. Because let's face it, temporary BMPs should be just that, temporary. The quicker you can get grass to establish, the quicker you reduce your probability of having major erosional features that would make you need to have somebody come back out, regrade, reseed, and restabilize that soil. As important as reclamation is, collecting your as-built data is just as important. Again, this is making sure that what you planned is what was built. This holds your contractor accountable. The other part of that is your, your engineered well pad is only as good as what was actually built. So to take it a step further, you can incorporate SWIP inspections into your project, right? So your SWIP inspector is not only going to let you know that your BMPs were installed, but if they were installed correctly. An example of this would be that top middle picture. You can see there's um, a gully forming underneath of that straw wattle. So water is actually cutting underneath of that straw wattle because it actually wasn't even designed, or it wasn't installed correctly. It, water, it wasn't trenched in, so water just cuts underneath of it. SWIP inspections can also help so that you can catch problems faster before they become bigger problems. All three of those pictures showing erosion concerns need to be addressed. And if they're not addressed, they become bigger problems. So now if you actually have your as-built data in place and you have stormwater inspectors, this time when you need to come back out there to have somebody regrade, reseed, and restabilize that soil, because you had those things in place and because you can prove maybe that that contractor didn't install those correctly, this isn't on your dollar this time. This might be on the contractor's. So as Corey mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the benefits of civil engineered well pads ultimately outweigh the cons. So what are those benefits? Well, here they are. Um, reduced cost and time saved during construction. Your contractors can bid apples to apples so that they can provide competitive bids against each other. Um, they construct projects according to precise standards and details, so there's no unknowns during construction, and more likely you will not have any change orders, hopefully. <laughs> um, stormwater mitigation is what we've been talking about the, through this whole presentation, reduces long-term operating costs and maintenance. Um, minimize risk of dealing with your regulatory agencies that might issue fines or investigations due to non-compliance. 
your neighbors and, your, and the adjacent landowners are happy and content because you don't have sediment and erosion leaving your site, uh, affecting their crops and their lands. Um, your civil facility and drilling teams are working together to maximize your pad efficiency and effectiveness. And then finally, improve safety. This is a big one in our industry. The risk of pad and road failure are minimized and exposure to unsafe roadway conditions for your people as well as the public is drastically improved. So what's the catch? Well, operators will likely spend, I mean invest, a little more money up front for an engineered pad versus your traditional well pad plat. But the bottom line is those upfront costs are just a drop in the bucket compared to the time and money you'll save over time. So we wanna leave you here today to think about a few questions. I want you to ask yourself, how much money does it cost for you to have your civil contractor remobilize and come to your site to clean up a muddy, rutted up pad and possibly place some additional surfacing? Or how much money do you lose when you have to shut in a well because your people aren't able to access the pad because of a, a roadway failure or maybe a flooded culvert that couldn't handle the rain event? Or how much money do you have to pay in fines because you had erosion on your pad that had sediment leave the site unknown and enter into an impact in adjacent wetland? And then we'd like to leave you with one more question. Which, Which one, one would, would you, you choose? choose? Thank you, Daphne and Corey. Our next speaker is Luke Lee. He's the Director of Operations with uh, Chief Oil Field Services. Um, he specializes in bioremediation and uh, has a BS in Business Administration from Haskell University. Um, just note that uh, Luke served as two years as a council rep for the three of, no, no, it didn't get changed, sorry. All right, <laughs> I'll let you talk about that. So, all right. Um, anyway, Luke, thanks. I didn't serve on council. So. Okay, it is no longer a viable option to simply excavate contaminated soil and move it to a landfill where it will continue to be toxic to the environment. This is not a solution, but simply a relocation. A better environmental solution is to have a cost-effective way to convert the contaminated soil into clean soil in a way that does not impact the land further. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luke Lee. I'm the Director of Operations for Chief Oil Field Services Bioremediation Division. And today I'm going to be presenting to you on bioremediation. Let's see if I can get this. So what is bioremediation? Simply put, bioremediation is a branch of biotechnology that employs the use of living organisms like microbes and bacteria in the removal of contaminants, pollutants, and toxins from the soil, water, and other environments. And how does bioremediation work? Bioremediation relies on the stimulating growth of certain microbes that utilize contaminants like oil, solvents, and pesticides for sources of food and energy. These microbes convert the contaminants into small amounts of water as well as harmless gases like carbon dioxide. And there are three general approaches to bioremediation. There's bioaugmentation, biostimulation, and natural attenuation. Bioaugmentation is the addition of microbes previously collected from other sites and commercially cultivated. Biostimulation is the addition of a nutrient or oxygen to the contaminated soil in hopes that it will be enough to get the indigenous microbes present to break down the contaminant. And then natural attenuation is simply just monitoring the site in hopes that the microbes present will mutate and actually break down the contaminant. And obviously, the most effective cleanup method is the bioaugmentation method, which we practice. Okay, uh, what do you need for effective bioremediation? Oxygen, a minimum oxygen at one parts per million, essential inorganic nutrients, 
such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, usually found in the soil, and then also uh, contact with the substrate. Um, the microbes need to make contact with the contaminant itself to be able to break it down. And then water, you need to have a 10% minimum water content in the soil, which can obviously be added. So why use this method of cleanup? First off, it is smaller footprint. You're not disrupting the, uh, the area. Other methods, you come in with um, the dig and haul method, so you'll dig up the contaminant and haul it off. So completely disrupting the area. Um, total elimination of cradle, cradle to grade liability. You're actually destroying the contaminant in place. Um, creates harmless byproducts after the, the microbes go through their process. What you have left over is CO2 and water, which are actually better amendments for the soil. And then last, cost effective. Compared to other methods, bioremediation is 50, 40 to 50 percent less. So our organism, the reason that our consortium of microbes are so effective is because they contain domain archaea which are a diverse group of organisms. They break down a variety of materials. They exist solely to recycle contaminants, and they, th they thrive in extreme environments, such as extreme cold and extreme hot temperatures. And obviously, in North Dakota, we're going to deal with uh, extreme cold. So it's good to have a microbe that's able to continue to break down the contaminant, even though it's 20 below. And here is a diagram showing you how the bacteria actually works. So the bacteria actually secretes an enzyme. The enzyme attacks the fats, sugars, and starches, breaking them down into smaller bits. This allows for the bacteria to actually eat up those broken down bits. They secrete the CO2 in water. And this process will happen over and over again until the contaminant is completely eradicated. And what you have left over is better amendments for the soil, which is CO2 and water. And through that process, the microbes are able to break down a wide variety of compounds. And I have a list here, and I'll name a few. We've got benzene, um, branched hydrocarbons, crude oils, cutting oils, diesel fuels, and heating oils. And here is a project that we're currently working on and remediating. So on this site, a uh, recycle pump was actually left on, causing an overflow uh, on the pad, and uh, the contaminant had flowed off on the side of the pad. And on the pad, they, dig, they did the dig and haul method. They hauled off all that soil. But off the pad, which uh, affected roughly 5,000 square feet, we did our remediation method. And through that remediation method, we were very effective in um, reducing the, the hydrocarbons. And here are some analytics from a third party. And as you can see, the DRO, diesel range organics, and the MRO, motor, ra motor range organics, had reduced roughly 90 to 95 percent. And this is over a six-month period. And they didn't have to put a shovel in the ground. And here is a, another project that we're currently remediating, and this is a tank battery containment area. And there was a, a release on this, in this containment that released roughly 100 barrels of oil. 50 was recovered. And through our uh, initial site analysis, we we um, seen that the oil had seeped down to roughly a foot around the whole containment. And then through our process, our remediation process, um, we were able to reduce those levels as well, as you can see. And this was over uh, a four-month period, reducing the diesel range organics and the motor oil range. And then here is some other analytics of other projects that were successful as well, utilizing this method of bioremediation. Um, some took a day, as you can see, the first one, heating fuel from uh, 160 parts per million down to five in just a day. Jet fuels, uh, 900 parts per million down to nine in 21 days. So, okay, and that's all I have. Thank you. Do we have time for any questions? Oh, yeah. Can you guys have any questions?
Yeah, we're constantly monitoring our, our projects and re-wetting the areas to ensure oxygen. And then um, also we have oxygenated water that we utilize as well. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Our last presentation for this session is another dynamic duo. Um, I'm really excited to to have our, our speakers here. Gene Datahan is an operations engineer um, with uh, Nesset Consulting. And Larry Dawkin, um, the, who is infamous in the Bakken. Um, I'll, I'll let him tell you what for. <laughs> and and uh, they're, they're gonna talk about our, our program in the state, um, working with CARES Act money to uh, uh, P and A Wells, um, incredible program, and so really interested to to hear the talk and uh, turn it over to you, Gene. Thanks. Is there a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> some pictures to make it fun, you know. Well, uh, first of all, uh, Ron Ness and Lynn Helms contacted contact me in June of 2020 about the CARES Act money that uh, Governor Burgum had uh, designated to plug and abandon orphan wells. And they uh, wanted me to come and meet with them, see if I wanted to take that project on. And I wasn't really sure right away. I kind of felt like I'd been Calm by a couple of used car salesmen, but after thinking about it, I decided to do it. <clears throat> so I met with Lynn, Ron Ness, uh, Kathy Nesset, and uh, Daryl Anderson from uh, HAMS. <clears throat> so we uh, kind of set the standards and the guidelines for the program. Uh, one thing, a lot of most of many of these wells that had been drilled prior to NDIC even requiring a a permit or a bond for these wells. So it saved the state and taxpayers a lot of money with this CARES Act money we got to use to plug these wells. And uh, some of the criteria they wanted was uh, they wanted all the vendors for, for the P&A project to be North Dakota based companies. And uh, it would, this would help keep the employees and the employers afloat and fund the companies through the COVID shutdown. We had to make a few exceptions. Uh, cementing was a shortage plus coil tubing, but other than that, every company we used had their home base in the state of North Dakota. 
<clears throat> after that, we've, we selected three consulting firms, Nesset Consulting, North Plains, and Petroleum Experience uh, were picked to lead the P&A operations. We had meetings in Bismarck and local meetings and got an agenda and a P&A process put together. Uh, the, we agreed each firm would have four consultants out at a time, which that would uh, be uh, 12 workover rigs going at one time. And that was probably really pushing it for the state because the state had other uh, issues and jobs for their uh, field supervisors, which we had to have present when we were doing the logging and perforating and cementing. So it, it was a tight schedule for everybody. And, but little did we know the huge impact this would have on the, all the business around, not just the oil, uh, just the service companies, but the secondary people, motels, hotels, cafes, gas stations, convenience stores, probably a few bars and, and uh, but this, uh, our startup date was uh, August 20th and uh, it ended December 31st, but we actually shut down just before Christmas, so we didn't have a lot of time. But uh, one of the biggest issues getting started was uh, the one calls. You know, every time you dig, you have to have a one call well, when you have 12 different companies going out to do a one call, and every time you're gonna do a one call for each thing you're, you're gonna, different thing you're gonna do, well, I finally got an agreement with the one call that we could use one ticket, and everybody could piggyback on that ticket as long as it was done within 30 days, so that really saved a lot of time. Then we had to have scouts go out and inspect the locations and contact all the landowners, let them know what we're going to do. And then uh, we had to install the admin and test them. Uh, line up service rate companies. We picked 10 companies that were locally owned that we could use. Coil tubing companies, water trucks, hot oil trucks, transportation trucks, hot shot, winch trucks, cranes, everything uh, we needed to get the job done. Blow up printers. We needed to locate some yards to store pumping units, rods and tubing. Once we got going, we had this, uh, all this rods and tubing stored. Toward the end of the project, we sold all the rods and tubing to local uh, ranchers and uh, farmers at a pretty good rate. I mean, for them, we didn't, we didn't do it to make money on it, but they were pretty happy, and I still get calls and wanting more. We had to have test tanks for the fluids. Uh, disposal site for the fluids. We'd have other disposal sites and waste sites for contaminated fluid and soils. That was a big issue. Some uh, norm in the tanks, we had a company that could handle that for us. <clears throat> we had, uh, one another issue we had was uh, companies with uh, downhole tools, packers, uh, bridge plugs, and retainers. When we told them the capacity and the volume we needed, they, they didn't believe us, you know. They said there's no way we could use that much stuff. But we finally got them on board, so we had enough rods and, uh, for, I mean, retainers and bridge plugs so we didn't have to shut down waiting on anything. We was, you might be setting two, three of them on a well a day and you got 12 wells going. There was a lot of, lot of equipment. Uh, Wireline trucks, we needed them to log, perforate, set bridge plugs and retainers. Some of the wells we need to have H2S equipment on, uh, hydro testers. A lot of this tubing is so junky <clears throat> with the, each of the firms finally got enough tubing tested so they had work strings so they just carried with them to the next location because it was, you know, some of it had the whole size of your fist and we even had some wells when we rigged up on the wellhead just broke right off them so we had to get welders in, weld a, a stub on them so we could get a BOP on them to work on them. We had to uh, have roustabout crews, payloaders to move rods and tubing, pumping units off the wells, mowers, cut some of the grass, some of these wells, the uh, weeds and everything is high, we had to get them cut before we dared to move on because of fires. And we had to have welders to cap the wells when we were done. 
that pretty much covered our uh, P and A. And then our reclamation side, we had to have soil specialists, we had to have uh, soil testing, drone imaging, dirt contractors. That took about 28 people per well, uh, just to for the reclamation. And the other project we had was the All Terrace Pipeline. Uh, that was over by Benny Pierre Road. It was 50 miles of pipeline. We had to take and go in and find all the risers and all the, all the fingers off the pipelines. We had to purge all of them, push all the fluids back into the main line and get the chlorides down so it was fresh water. Then we capped those fingers off and then we're done and we purged the whole main line, got all the fluid out. And uh, Nes Nesset Consultant was in charge of that. What we done, we hired two guys, Tom Schumacher and Glenn Wallen. They were retired NDIC guys, worked for the commission. And so it really worked good because they knew so many of the ins and outs that nobody else was really aware of and it worked very well with the industrial commission because they knew how to get everything done. We had, they, um, they didn't figure we would get that done last fall, but we come in about a million dollars under what the projected cost of that was gonna be. And to, uh, for all this stuff, all our vendors had to sign a, an MSA <clears throat> that was a, kind of a, between the consulting firms and NDIC had approved the MSAs. And then all the vendors were paid uh, within two weeks after each phase of the well to keep their money uh, from the project to keep them afloat rather than have to take their own money out. And uh, uh, a big thanks to Governor Burgum and Lynn Helms for putting this project together and saving thousands of jobs. And I'll let Gene Dadhan continue. Sure. Um, do you have any ideas like of the total percentage of the work over the rigs working at that time? Uh, what this work was in terms of percentage? Well, um, I believe, I, 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 I'm not sure in that, but I can tell you that each one of these wells uh, uh, result in about 768 different people employed per well with different jobs. And uh, 12 wells being plugged at the same time, uh, that's on, uh, the, excuse me, the, uh, 768 was on the 12 rigs. And then it's about 64 people per well that had different jobs, so it was, it was a huge project. I think uh, they figured what the direct and indirect impact was about 37,000 people involved in this. With the, by the time you you know all your outside stuff. So. trying to test out this flipping through the presentation. Is this what you use? Green, Green button. We'd like to show you a video that I Ain't Jack Productions created and produced on behalf of Nested Consulting and the NIC website um, on the PNA program. Um, yes, if you could please play the video for us. Two thousand and twenty was a challenging year for us. Uh, it actually started out in January and February, fairly good months. Well, then March hit. Two thousand and twenty was a challenging year for us. Uh, it actually started out in January and February, fairly good months. Well, then March hit and the pandemic caused the oil price to collapse. And then we basically were at a standstill. It was devastating. It's, and to a level that we have never seen before. You know, what did companies do? What we saw immediately is they started pulling everything in. They dropped the drilling rigs. 
We came to about March 8th of 2020. Saudi Arabia and Russia began their price war about curtailing production. It just absolutely decimated this industry, the oil and gas industry. When March hits and you come to a screaming halt, it's sleepless nights wondering what you're going to do next and how long is it going to last. What happened is a lot of people lost their jobs. Good, solid, long-term workforce um, was put out, of, put out of business. The whole world was affected by it, so obviously there were also no jobs and, you know, people getting laid off. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be working. Eventually, you know, the CARES Act money comes, and our Governor Burgum, working with state officials, decided one of the allocations of that money would be to the North Dakota Industrial Commission and our director, DMR director, Lynn Helms, to take care of a long-standing problem, and that is capping and a permanent abandon to wells that have been abandoned out in the field. Yeah, I was uh, in control of the whole project, so I had to hire all the services, starting from the work over eggs, the cement companies, roustabouts, water trucks, anything to do with plugging the wells. We had three to four rigs going, being that it was such a tight deadline that, you know, we really had to make sure everything was going efficiently. If I had one guy in the in Burke County, um, I had to make sure that all the wells he was going to stays in Burke County because there's no point having all these rigs travel back and forth. One of the criteria they wanted set up was that we had to use all North Dakota companies that had a base, home base in North Dakota. We wanted to make sure this money recirculated in North Dakota so if this thing came back, they had people to work. You know, that was the big thing with this CARES Act money. We wanted to save the services, save the experience. It kept that experience in the state instead of letting these guys leave because they didn't have a job. Oil has kind of come back. Now we've got experienced people still working on these wells instead of having to retrain people. And the cost of retraining these people is astronomical. That's a lot of invoices, processing that and approving, making sure that that is exactly what we did. And, and then a fast turnaround, sending that to the state so then we can pay these vendors right away. Because that was a, you know one of the goal here is to keep these North Dakota businesses in business. It was perfect timing to have something like this that took care of a problem for the state, put a lot of good people to work, and uh, keep them around for when the industry got back on its feet. The routes about hauler rods and tubing, we sold it to all the landowners. I sold all the pump and used to one company. And then when it was done, we uh, issued a check to the state for over $250,000. Fast forward to 2021, oil prices rebounded. There's some optimism in the industry. Companies are starting to put wells back online. Projects are starting up again. So thanks to the P&A project, we were able to keep 100% of our staff on. It helped everyone a lot and took away the sleepless nights. It was the best project I've been involved in, for sure. We ended up plugging 280 wells. We reclaimed 143 wells, plus 640 acres of land we put back into production. We reclaimed a 50 mile uh, abandoned pipeline, saved about a million dollars on cost. So that video does a really good job at um, explaining the situation that we're all in, you know, being that the COVID-19 pandemic eventually hits the U.S. and the prices, oil price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia really starts to intensify. And so our U.S. oil prices fell and essentially collapsed the oil industry here in North Dakota. And a lot of people were in the same situation where you either lost your job or you're unsure that you're going to have one tomorrow. And I can relate to that. I wasn't sure um, I was going to keep my job. And working down here with a visa, there was a possibility that would be revoked. And so um, a few statistics here, according to the state back in 
Last year of March, 6,200 wells were shut in. That entails 450,000 barrels of production shut in. Um, at this time, there were 11 drilling rigs operating, one frack crew, almost 800 wells were abandoned, and thousands and thousands of unemployment claims were flat filed, and of course, the gas plants were also affected. And so, something had to be done, and on March 25th, uh, the U.S. Senate passed the Two Trillion Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which is where the acronym CARES Act comes from, essentially to help stabilize our workers, families, and the economy during this pandemic. And the, one of the many problems that arises during an economic downturn is that these operators and well owners really start to get in trouble financially to a point where they can no longer operate the wells and you know the wells get abandoned and then to a more extreme point gets orphaned and the difference between an orphan well and an abandoned well is that an abandoned well has a liable operator it just hasn't been producing or injecting for over 12 months whereas an orphaned well does not have a li liable operator who is financially and legally responsible to deal with the well. Now, thankfully, North Dakota has zero orphan wells, um, but 549 abandoned wells could have been or orphaned due to the pandemic. And so our Governor Burgum worked with state officials and decided that one of the allocations of the CARES Act funding would be towards the NAIC Oil and Gas Division to plug and reclaim these abandoned wells. And so this was essentially the creation of the Bakken Restart Task Force Action Plan. And within this action plan, there were multiple focus areas, not just the p and um, but in terms of allocations of funding, $33 million was approved for plugging work and $33.2 million was approved for reclamation work. Um, during the preliminary stages of the program, 368 abandoned wells were, were reviewed for, um, as candidates for the program. Now, earlier, Larry explained to you kind of the operational um, stages of the project, you know, the scope of it, where he was contacted by Lynn Helms to over, overall senior um, project manage the whole uh, program, whereas I project coordinated uh, Nesset's operational involvement of it. As Larry said, official startup was August 20, 2020, and then a tight deadline of December 31st. 2020. Now, the program can be divided into two phases, phase, phase one, well plugging, and phase two, surface reclamation. Well plugging is the process of um, isolating specific intervals of the well bore to prevent communication of fluids um, by means of a mechanical plug or multiple cement plugs. To simplify the process, it can be divided into four steps. Number one being a workover rig is utilized to remove all, all your tubulars downhill equipment such as your rod, tubings, and your bottom hole assembly. And once all of that is removed down hole, then you can pump all your cement or mechanical plugs at specific intervals. These specific intervals are your completed zones, your flow potential zones, surface casing shoe, and then your uppermost uh, plug, which is your surface plug. This is just one scenario, just one example. You can have as many as seven plugs or three plugs, and it really depends on your wellbore conditions, um, wellbore design, and formations penetrated, and many more other factors. So after you've plugged or plugged the well, you cut your casing four feet below your surface level, and after that, a steel cap is welded on on top of the cut casing. Within this phases, uh, Larry worked out the numbers and really thought of who was involved and what job types were involved from start to finish of plugging a well. And it came out to be 23 job types were involved and that is 64 individuals per well just plugging one well. So that's a lot of people involved already. Then on phase two, surface reclamation, which is just a process of returning your land into its original state or closest to its uh, surrounding environment. As you can see on this photo right here, this is a photo of an abandoned well site that one of our field consultants uh, took for us. You can see, you know, something like this hasn't been really producing over two or three years, how detrimental it can be to our local farmers. And again, to simplify the process, it can be divided into six steps. 
uh, your flow lines has to be flushed and capped, all your surface equipment has to be removed, any contaminated soil or equipment has to be hauled off and disposed of properly. And then you have to recontour your site, distribute your topsoil evenly, spread it out, and of course, uh, revegetate your area with native species unless otherwise requested by your surface owners or landowners. And again, within this process, uh, 11 job types were involved and 35 individuals per well site uh, was involved. And adding all that together, that's 99 total North Dakota workers involved in plugging one well. And to me, that's a highlight on its own, but we can, we can talk more about highlights and results here. So the, these results were collected after the deadline of December 31st. Um, one being, like you saw in the video, 280 wells were plugged across North Dakota. This is just a glimpse of the wells that were plugged. This map specifically shows um, consistently of wells that Nessic Consulting plugged. We plugged wells all over Williams County, Burke County, Botanou County. So these are the really old wells that were drilled, you know, 1950s and 60s and all that. Very, very shallow wells, old wells. So. Next being 143 abandoned well sites were reclaimed. Now I understand that that doesn't match up how many wells were plugged, and that's because it takes a lot longer to reclaim your land. You can, you can plug your well three to five days in a good week, but it can take up to 15 days to reclaim a land or longer. Um, but nevertheless, 640 acres were, were reclaimed, and you can see the before and after photo show, shown here on the screen you know, how, how different it makes to our local farmers. In addition to that, the Alturas water gathering system was reclaimed and within that, that entails 50 miles, approximately 50 miles of poly pipeline. And with that, 39 above ground risers, 18 above ground facilities, and three known contaminated areas were, were reclaimed within that process. And so this alone was a highly significant project. It really involved a lot of highly skilled, um, very, very experienced workers on its own. So this alone involved a lot, a lot of jobs. According to um, conservative estimates of the state, combining the three highlights I just showed you, 37,000 jobs was involved. And this were, were primarily from services directly related to the operations, so your wildland company, uh, roustabouts, work over rigs, cementing, you name it. But like Larry mentioned, we can't, however, forget about our secondary services. You know, these are your bars, your gas stations, your convenience stores. I really made an impact on the smaller towns around North Dakota, like Lignite, West Hope, Mohall, and those are just a few examples who really depend on the activity of the oil and gas industry. And so um, that, that was a, a pretty significant impact, I would say. Additionally, all of the salvage surface equipment like your pumping units and your pump houses as well as downhill equipment like your rods and tubing, we were able to sell that um, to local vendors and local farmers. I mean, you can't believe how many calls Larry and I received from farmers wanting to buy rods and, and tubing, and you probably know what for, but you can see on this yard right here just lines and lines of dismantled pumping units and pump houses. And again, uh, we were able to issue that check back to the state so we can save some money um, during the, for the project. Moving on to what I like to call the muscles of the program, although Larry probably prefers I call him the muscles of the program. <laughs> uh, the names you see on the screen here is just a small percentage of the vendors that was utilized. Um, we, it averaged out to be 20, at least 20 vendors that was, was utilized in both in phase one and phase two. And so there were a lot of invoices involved. I mean, there really had to be a fast paced, organized process in place on everybody's part because one of the criteria, again, was to get these vendors paid fast enough where they can use CARES Act funding to cover their expenses. Um, so really, really fabulous job on the, on the NDIC as well. I mean, they would have at least received 400 invoices and for them to process that uh, fast enough, we were able to distribute the payments to our vendors. One of the vendors that, that was used, this photo was gifted to us 
from Hamswell Services, they were able to uh, keep 100% of their staff. And you can see just by this picture how much of an impact it made to just one vendor, yet alone all of the other vendors that was, that was involved in the PNA program. And we actually received letters from a few of these participants. Um, they shared their stories and expressed their gratitude, and we simply don't have time to go over these letters individually, but feel free to come visit us at our Nesset booth, and I'd love to share these, these letters with you, and, and we can go through them together. And with that, I'd like to end this presentation uh, by saying thank you to our North Dakota leaders and Governor Bargum, uh, Lynn Helms, Director of Mineral Resources, and Ron Ness, Petroleum uh, Council President. Uh, without their leadership, we wouldn't have this program at all last year, and it was a really good project that I was involved in, I would say. And yeah, thank you for your time and being patient with the, all the technical difficulties and being patient with that. And if you have any more questions, you can find a lot of information on the NDIC website. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gene and Larry. That was a great update on a very successful project to keep North Dakotans working. We're ready for a 30 minute break. There's some refreshments outside the hallway here, so please enjoy, but please be back for our downhole session at three o'clock. Thank you.